The Elysee Treaty of 1963 put our bilateral relation on a solid base of collaboration in all fields, common agenda for the future, and a shared interest in a powerful Europe. In addition to very strong German-Dutch and French-Dutch relations, we have learned in the last years to have a substantial trilateral dialogue with the Netherlands. Uh, this uh, uh, bilateral cooperation must benefit to the EU and to our EU partners. And uh, one of the first partners is uh, the Netherlands. And we are extremely happy uh, that there are uh, consultations increasingly with uh, uh, our Dutch friends in a trilateral format. Um, the Franco-German relationship for everybody who deals with Europe uh, sometimes or on a daily basis is always some kind of an, an enigma. Because when it is strong, everybody complains, and especially here in The Hague. When it is weak, Everybody complains too because there's no, there's no, you know, everybody is in a flu. Uh, um, so in a way, uh, for France and for Germany uh, to have a strong relationship, uh, you're damned if you have it and you're damned if you don't have it. What is this uh, partnership exactly? How did it uh, develop over time? And uh, can we, can they ever do it right? The Elysee Treaty has sort of two elements. There's the sort of government relations um, and sort of you know the twice a year meetings between the president and the chancellor, uh, the meetings between the foreign ministers, between the staff, and then there's this whole country people to people element, language, youth exchanges, and. It does seem to have worked uh, to some extent. It's quite surprising. If you look, for example, at a recent poll asking the question, uh, do you trust uh, Germany? Uh, uh, the French are asked these questions. Then 80% of the French say, yes, we really trust uh, Germany. And if you ask the same question, you know, should the German government trust Paris and France, 80% of the Germans say the same thing. And 80% is quite a lot. It's, it's a lot if you compare it to other countries. Uh, you know, the same question with the U.S. is asked, and then both countries are around 55, 60 percent. So there's a clear difference that sort of trust between peoples um, have been, uh, have been uh, created. I think for the French, this Franco-German relationship seems to me to be even more important uh, than perhaps it is uh, for the Germans. Um, yes, and today, of course, there's a big difference uh, that France is a, a nuclear power yes. and Germany is dependent on uh, the United States for nuclear arms. Uh, Germany is becoming more in the center of Europe uh, due to the Ukraine war, uh, whereas uh, France and also the Netherlands are more on the western side of, uh, of Europe or become more. To, so geopolitically, things are changing a lot. And I think also, in general, the, 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 the concept of the French-German axis is most often uh, pronounced, pronounced here in the Netherlands, because the, the idea that France and Germany together are, a, are a, a firm bond and that the Netherlands can, don't have any power to, uh, well, to influence it, that's, uh, well, that, that, that's, that's really a, a big thing for the Dutch, and that's also the reasons why they uh, were very welcoming the, the British. Uh, and I think they really needed the, the British to, to love the European Union. Uh, Joseph, how important do you think the, the axis uh, between Berlin and Paris still is today? I think it has changed. Um, it is still important, but its role has changed. Historically, you called it the Franco-German motor. It was uh, Paris and Bonn who started often big EU initiatives, and then they agreed on something, for example, the Euro, and then they tried to convince others. So they were sort of, you know, like the ignition of European integration. I think since a while now, this is much less the case. Um, Europe has become bigger, um, the, you know, the parity between the two countries has changed, um, especially with reunification, also afterwards for economic reasons. 
and Europe has become larger. And in a sense, it's, it's great news that sort of Germany and France are not anymore sort of so key to the European Union and to starting uh, new integration efforts. But you still need them. In the past, Germany and France had to be together so the EU ship could you know, leave the port or you know, they, they decided the direction of the EU ship more or less on their own. And I think today they can't decide the direction of the ship on their own anymore. Um, but in order for the ship to leave the port at the end, they have to be together. Mm. Do you agree with that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I had the impression. Sorry. Um, we talk about 2020. In February, the COVID crisis evolved. Already on the 5th of March, Angela Merkel told in a, a press conference that this was a, a catastrophe comparable with a natural catastrophe and that the European Treaty has uh, uh, solutions uh, or is allowed to have solutions which are totally out of the, how do you say it, no way out control and all the, the restrictions. Uh, we have already. Then they started to negotiate uh, uh, within the, 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 the Euro, Euro group uh, about what would, what they would pay, and a, a huge amount of money was uh, reserved. The Dutch were very critical about it, but the Germans weren't. Uh, and then, in I think in uh, March, April, Macron wrote an article in the Financial Times and everybody said, see, it's Macron's proposal. And the Germans really uh, led Macron uh, to have his success. But Merkel was already at the beginning of March convinced that, uh, that this uh, recovery fund should be established. Uh, and then in May, they came together and then it was presented as a French-German initiative. Whereas, and, and I think they had to present it because the Dutch were so critical, for, so among your, others. Your but the point Dutch were, is that they were at the very beginning. They were at the beginning, and, and the Dutch were at the end, the end very critical. The Dutch have always been critical of Germany and France acting as a tandem in Europe. A smaller Europe in the beginning and a much larger Europe, EU Europe, um, right now. Do you think um, the role of the of the Netherlands is is changing at the moment because of Brexit in this respect? My point of view, the role of the Dutch did not change that much. Mm. Uh, what has changed is that they lost their big friend, Great Britain. Um, I mean, there are three three major cultural influences in Europe. You had the the German more federalistic. Uh, and legalistic culture. You had the French more etatist uh, uh, culture, and then liberalism. And in this, in this th third sort of big cultural influence, the Dutch felt uh, at their best. But now, this uh, because of Brexit, this uh, culture is weakened in, in Europe. Um, and I think this forced uh, the Dutch not just the government, but also people in ministries, um, to reach out to many more member states all over the continent than they ever did before. Um, and it's clear that, f I mean, they, they put their eggs in different baskets right now. But of course, from the other side, maybe, but maybe you can explain this, uh, Joseph, um, why we can understand now why uh, President Macron is interesting for Mark Rutte. If he wants to push something in Brussels or block something in Brussels, he cannot just phone London anymore on certain subjects. So you need to reach out uh, for different uh, partners. But what makes Mark Rutte interesting for Macron? Maybe you can, you can answer that question. Well, what is interesting in, in uh, Macron's sort of European policy is that on the one hand, it's very classical French, sort of François Mitterrand type. The Franco-German relationship is at the heart of Europe, and we want to convince Berlin of our ideas. And at the beginning, in 2017, Macron invested a lot of time and political capital uh, on, on rekindling this relationship with Germany, uh, charming Merkel as it was possible. And by the way, this is in domestic politics in France still something somehow controversial to do. There's a lot of still in 
in, in some uh, political quarters on the far right, but also on the far left, and of anti-German resentment. But he did something as well, a sort of a parallel track, and he built a lot of relationships with, uh, with other European leaders, and one of the important ones was with Mark Rutte, who pretty much from the beginning he tried to you know, have a personal relationship, meet him, etc., because he was realizing Rutte has some power center, is a sort of center of gravity in this Europe. He's been there for, for a very long time, and he realized if he wants to go anywhere, he needs to have a relationship there. Um, probably what was really important was um, if we uh, remember the Meseberg Declaration, the sort of Franco-German deal at the very beginning, um, you know, that was seen to be blocked by the Netherlands. So if he wanted to move forward there, he needed to unblock Rutte. And there are a couple of things where he worked together with Rutte very well, and where he did exactly what I uh, still think is true and I explained before, <laughs> which is another example, for example, where, uh, where he built an alliance to put pressure on Berlin to, uh, to do a deal with him at the very end, and that is, for example, the rule of law mechanism. Here, you had a situation where there was an alliance, the Netherlands, but also Scandinavian countries and France that were pushing for a more uh, rule of law mechanism that has more teeth in the negotiations for the EU's multi-annual financial framework. And Germany and Merkel, that was very hesitant to do so for her historic reasons, for reasons she always, uh, she was reticent to do this. And here again, a sort of a coalition pushed and said, we need to be strong on rule of law. And at some point Merkel said, okay, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's find a deal and the compromise um, came at the very end. It's just, as I was saying before, I think the EU is bigger, uh, there are more people to talk to, it's more flexible, and Macron is the first president in France who actually really realizes this. Does Europe actually need a, a very strong partnership between France and Germany uh, at the moment? Or does the need even reside? Depends on what you want. <laughs> if you want more European integration, I think uh, the, the French-German relation is essential. Uh, without them, uh, there, there is no uh, possibility to, to really have change within in Europe, I think. So, uh, and I also think that we often hear that it is a very, that the relation is not that good, not good anymore mm -hmm. today. I doubt it a little bit at least. Would you agree with that, Joseph, that, um, that uh, the, the problems, the difficulties, between France and Germany are often exaggerated and maybe are more a problem of communication than anything else. And the in the last they months, agree I mean, exactly. more than people think sometimes? No, I think, I think it's not a problem of communication. Um, I think there's, um, there are real disagreements on substance uh, that are there. And I think sort of the, the current crisis or however you want to call it, um, Let's not talk about crisis. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. There's always a crisis. There's always a crisis, uh, but I think there's uh, there's some reasons to take it serious in a sense and and to think about it. And I think there are two uh, two things here. Um, there's on the one hand, uh, from the French side, a sort of feeling um, that there's a sort of distancing going on um, from uh, from Germany from this Franco-German couple. And that has to do with Olaf Scholz uh, being, uh, being in power um, in his big speech on Europe, uh, the Prague speech. Olaf Scholz uh, didn't mention, for example, the Franco-German couple um, you know, in his big speech on Europe. That was you know, noticed in, in France. And, uh, and uh, as I was telling you before, for the French, really this Franco-German relationship is the key to understanding Europe. And suddenly they feel, ooh, is there, you know, Germany maybe distancing itself from this historic idea of the Franco-German couple. And, um, and that is something that worries, right? That I think the second story is, um, is, is the Zeitenwende. Um, to some extent, um, you know, it's interesting because if you look at sort of economic policy, France and Germany have rarely been so close to each other. Um, if you look over the last couple of years, German thinking on economics and geoeconomics has massively evolved 
and towards a direction that is more French. Yes. Uh, the idea, basically, that we live in a world where because of the energy transition, because of war, because of competition over strategic sectors, you have to move towards a slightly more state-centric economic model where you know, the government has a role to invest in industrial sectors, um, where you have to rekindle your trade tools, um, where you also need to be ready to spend more money. You know, If we agreed it on next generation EU, at the time it was also because we understood that we ourselves have to um, solve this economic crisis caused by this pandemic. And we can't do as in the Eurozone crisis 10 years earlier, where we let the Chinese spend the money so we could get out of it. We didn't want that to happen again because it weakened us geopolitically. And I think there's a big agenda between Germany and France where they work much more closer together today, where there's a real alignment or a rapprochement between the two. But on the other hand, there is a second issue where the divisions are actually bigger. And, uh, and this is on the question of defense and, um, and the sort of geopolitical side of it. In France, there was this big hope that sort of the tides of history would eventually you know, wash up the Germans on the banks of the Seine River, and that they eventually, when the Germans would have realized how the world really works, I'm, I'm, you know, from a French perspective, seen, from, me, France. seen yeah. from France, that they would then say, okay, now we do together this you know, Franco-German thing, and we build that sovereign Europe, and we go into the defense, and finally the dream can be realized, the old Gaulist dream, right? And then Russia invades Ukraine. And then Russia invades Ukraine, and they think, wow, okay. And, um, but in reality, what we're seeing since then in Germany is that Germany is changing its defense policy, but France doesn't play a big role in that change of defense policy. Um, you know, and, and Germany sort of plays its own role. It buys a lot of American arms. Um, it continues with the FGAS, with the Franco-German fighter jets, but it doesn't go full in France. It doesn't say, okay, let's, you know, now we build that. It still is hedging between the US and France and other countries. We're seeing it in the, in the tank debate as well. And even Germany is playing its own cards between these centers of power. So, you know, it's really interesting. It says, on the one hand, you know, it says, we're with the US, and this alignment with the US is key for us, you know, in Ukraine. Uh, Scholz is being very clear that he cares about what Washington says, much less than, much more than what, what Paris or London thinks, you know, in arms deliveries. But at the same time, he doesn't subject, subject himself to the US either, you know, he you know, tries to delay on tanks, etc. He has his own position, which he's fighting for. He says, um, you know, I don't want to follow the US on China, I don't want a Cold War with China. Uh, but at the same time, he says to French President Macron, who says, let's go to Beijing together, he says no either. So, so there was a hope that sort of this geopolitical cycle bender would lead to a big Franco-German rapprochement on defense and, and foreign affairs. And this hasn't really happened. And that is probably one of the, one of the big disputes um, uh, that we've seen playing out over the last couple of months. Mm -hmm. But I'm not so sure if the Germany is insecure. I think Germany in the last decades is realizing itself step by step that they are an important country which should be reckoned with. Uh, and towards France, I would say, say uh, particularly Schultz, during the election campaign said that he immediately wanted to go to France and immediately want to restore the relations and uh, so the French-German axis also as a historical bond should be take the initiative to, to take new reforms and it didn't happen. So that's a very interesting thing. I think it's a sort of tragic love couple who want to approach to each other but don't know how to dance. Uh -huh. and, and to find a new language actually to, to cooperate together and there the, the Dutch could have a role to translate uh, policy issues, uh, French policy issues towards the Germans and the other way around. Uh, As a trade union, oui. almost. Uh, Caroline, how do, how do you see that? How do you see the Dutch maneuvering in the European Union now and, and, and uh, in, in the last uh, years and maybe also the years to come in this 
mm. trilateral mm. cooperation? I think the Dutch, to start with, were completely orphaned by Brexit. Um, I, I really know quite a few people who, in several ministries, who would make that famous phone call to London and see, you know, if they wanted to move something in Brussels, if and if London would support them, and if if they had the support of the UK. I mean, you just needed to phone the Danish, maybe, or the Swedes, and you were there. So it made the Dutch a little bit lazy in Europe. Brexit. Um, <coughs> closed off that road. I mean, they couldn't play that game anymore. So they had to, and Brexit also made France and Germany a little bit more, a little bit larger than they were, relatively speaking. So I, um, I think the Dutch way of working radically changed. I think we set priorities much more thematically than before, um, because they had to look ahead if they wanted uh, I mean, they had to look ahead and see what issues were coming up, what they would agree with and what they would not agree with. Um, and those issues determined which rounds they would start making in Europe, which meant that they, had, they, they needed to really work uh, on bilateral relations with all the other member states much more intensively than before. I know some people in national embassies in other member states who were just all of a sudden, uh, you know, they were, they were working uh, twice as hard as, as before. Can you check what, the, what, what they think about this? Can you check what they think about that? Um, but it also <coughs> means that you, um, that you need to identify issues that you're not going to kick a fuss on. Because if you are lining up, for instance, Austria, on the budget, on the fight for or against whatever, the European budget, the Austrians will want something back. So you need to have a list of your priorities, but also a list of, of giveaways. And this is how the Dutch started to make the rounds in Europe. It's a fundamental, fundamentally different game. And I think a lot of people, it's a new game, a lot of people in the ministries actually liked it. It was something new. Um, so it even reinvigorated. Um, the, yeah, the, the way the Dutch were behaving um, in Europe. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy yourself for that. Thank you.